Join me, Phil Stephanie and Russell Gerber on an interactive show designed to give you more insight and context to all things African. On point today, Birds of African. Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to the On Point Show with Russell and Phil. Welcome, Phil. Hey, Russ. Glad to have you back. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's good to be here with you guys again. How's Max? Max is giving us thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> so today, guys, we're going to be going through a bunch of the wonderful birds that we get on Africam. We uh, get all kinds coming to visit to the water holes, of course, and today we've structured it in a way that will be easy for you to understand. We're going to go through different types of birds, from common birds to more rare sightings, some of our special sightings. We'll do some nocturnal birds and, of course, the ever-popular raptors. So as we go, of course, if you guys have any questions, please remember to pop those questions in the question box just below your picture. And if you haven't registered already, you do need to do so to ask questions. So go ahead and do that and you can join the conversation. And we started off with a lovely clip here of these weavers. They're obviously pretty common at most of our water holes that we see. And one of our more common species is, of course, the southern mast weavers. And on the right-hand side, if you look carefully, there's actually a lesser weaver. It's got a different color eye. And those little differences are some of the special things that we'll be going over today. And one of the more difficult things to identify is these different types of weavers. And it's why birding itself is such a specialized field. And there are so many out, so many guides out there who focus on birds alone as their sole speciality in taking people out into the field. Yeah, I must say, Russ, the identification of weavers is right up there with the little brown jobs for me. I think this one's a bit easier. <laughs> Guys, I'm going to put the question out to you all like we did, uh, we do in the past. What, um, what ox peck is this? It's not, it's not a tricky one, but uh, if anyone has any idea of which one is two that we sometimes see on various cameras talking about bird identification. Sometimes it's easy, other times it's quite tricky. But this is a great clip, Russ, of, of uh, this oxpecker just hanging in there on the, on the kudu's back. Yeah, I mean, again, one of the more popular bird species and something often questioned or asked about because of its behavior and, and its relationship with all of these wild animals. and. Of course, oxpeckers are one of many birds that have these mutually beneficial relationships with other animals in the environment. And this, of course, a mutualistic um, behavior that you actually see. But you often get different species of bird that, that actually feed together, you know, which we call cooperative feeding. And this is a great example here. Phil. Yeah, a great example of... Uh the magpie strikes and the buffalo weavers, the magpie strikes are the ones with the long tails, but otherwise quite similar. And what's quite interesting about these, these two species, and they actually feed a lot on insects. And I think they might even be feeding on termites in between having a drink. I don't know if the termites have been attracted to that dry elephant dropping, but you do often see them together. It's also quite nice to listen to the calls of the magpie strike. And just as we say that, of course, they stop calling. But, uh, <laughs> they do have that wonderfully clear call that uh, is quite easy to identify in the bush, but a beautiful vocalization that you hear from the magpie strikes. Ah, uh, I see. We've got some answers coming in. Brilliant. Great stuff, Christy. Red billed oxpecker, Sally, Suki, you're all on it. Those of you that were on the On Point show last week, we had Pete with us. I think he's confused. He's asking if it's a banded mongoose. No, Pete? Red-billed oxpecker. <laughs> <laughs> this is why he's not allowed back on the show. So. He's there talking about red bills. Looks like red-billed hornbills come to join the feeding party here. 
always busy using that big bill digging around for mostly insects, grubs, worms. I'd say quite a successful feeder hornbill. Yeah, for sure. Again, one of the more common species you get around the national parks of southern Africa. But such an interesting bird to watch, as you can see in there. Yeah, it looks often, like they're fighting over that morsel. Yeah, they're often very interactive. And, and, and because they spend so much time on the ground like this, you do see them nice and op in the open and in the clear and can often observe real interesting behaviors for them, which is pretty common for birds that you do see out and about on the ground. You can spend hours watching them. Very comical indeed. I think that one thought that that was something to eat, but then when everyone came to have a closer look, they ditched it and maybe it's a rock <laughs> or maybe <laughs> it's a it seed, like it, unedible yeah. seed. I think the, the Lion King did a good job in capturing their character. I love watching hornbills. Very, very comical. Yeah, it's trying to dig around again. Elephant dropping is always a great place to observe birds feeding. Talking about beautiful birds, in this case, not doing as much as the as the hornbill. But I tell you what, this lilac breasted roller is right up there with one of my favorites. I think, Marcel, I'm not sure if you're watching on the last show, you were confirming the number of colors on a lilac breasted roller. Maybe that's another question we'll, we'll fire out at you guys. Any ideas how many different colors on a lilac breasted roller? Marcel, you were close. So any ideas there? Russ, why is it opening its beak? Well, lilac is one of the colors, so you're not oh, allowed to well use done, that Russ. one. <laughs> <laughs> and why is he opening his beak? Well, folks, it's a pretty common behavior for birds doing this. They, they use it to basically regulate their temperatures, so they're not able to sweat as we are. This is one way that they will regulate the temperatures in their bodies. But one of the great things about Africam and the things that we get to see is because of the silence and because there aren't people around and we just have the cameras and the, and the birds, we get to see these wonderful natural behaviors. And you can see that here with these little um, red billed wood hoopoos or green wood hoopoos as they're called these days. It was a bit confusing, these older names and new names. But I was um, always quite interested about nesting wood hoopoos. These green wood hoopoos actually have the ability to spray jets of dropping or, or as a defense, especially when they're nesting. They can actually defecate in jets with a very high uric acid content to chase off things like snakes. Oh, and, I actually uh, didn't know that. So if, yeah. they, if something approaches the nest, they yeah. actually so, spray out. So don't stick your nose down that hole. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one right in there. And actually the chicks do that as well quite successfully. So it's quite a smart animal. And I guess if you, you if you're nesting inside a tree like that, you have to contend with all sorts of things like snakes um, and squirrels, uh, other birds, I guess. We've, we've often seen... Um, the barber that's trying to get in there. Yeah. My daughter did something similar in her cot when we, she was little. Oh dear. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a great sighting, you know, this one. And again, something that we get pretty often where we get nice and close like this on the birds without disturbing them. And it's, it's not something that is common to being out in the bush because often when you're out in the vehicles, you'll disturb them and you don't get to enjoy these sorts of behaviors. I must say, I've actually never seen that, but um, it, it is something that's always fascinated me. It's always nice to see these birds together. There's lots of them in a flock between four, sometimes seven, make a lot of noise and to get great photographs and great images in fact to get good photographs of birds in general is not easy they're easily spooked so i find the birding that we actually get to see on these cameras is quite incredible we've got some special sightings coming up and some of them are right up there with really unusual sightings and as well as unusual behavior but this makes a great snapshot i'm not sure if anyone got it when this was being filmed that they seem to be quite relaxed, just enjoying the space, giving us a great view.
Yeah, it's a great point, Phil. You know, one of the most difficult things out there, and we had the shot of that beautiful lilac-breasted roller a few minutes ago, and that is easily one of the most photographed birds on safari in Africa. People spend ages trying to get the perfect shot. It can be really difficult with the noisy vehicles, but something that we don't see often in big numbers, something like this, are these wonderful marabou storks. Now, they are considered one of the uglier species of bird, which is, I think, a little unfair. Um, they have a role to play, just like all ugly things on the planet. Um, but unlike the lilac-breasted roller, one of the less photographed bird species, I would say, but really, really important to the environment itself. Yeah, I must say it's a tough act to follow lilac-breasted roller, green wood hoopoo, and then poor old marabou stork. Talking about using excrement, though, as valuable tools, these guys are well known to defecate on their legs to keep them cool. Uh, you always see they've got very white very legs. Very white legs. And it's right. often a question asked about these really interesting birds. <laughs> is that whiteness is actually keeping them cool? Yeah, incredible uh, soarers as well. They cover huge distances, such a big body, massive wingspan. And I must say again, although they're not the most beautiful bird to look at, I do find them quite interesting to observe. I wouldn't like to be an insect in their way right now, or a little snake. <laughs> Lizard, anything they might come across. Yeah. yeah, it looks like they're on the rampage. Okay, so it looks like we're getting some answers in here, Russ. Sally, we've got Sally's 10 got colors. 10. Yeah, Suki, eight colors. Let's wait and see who else comes up with anything else. Pete, if you're listening, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> But the marabou stalks are also, as they're walking by here, I don't know if anyone's given them a count, but this is a nice big group, and I'm sure there must have been something delicious to feed on there. Now, what's quite interesting about this clip, is you've got a tawny eagle on the right, and you've got a hooded vulture on the left, also very well known for predominantly scavengers, as well as the marabou stalks. Yeah, shifting now in to the raptors, you know, moving away from our more common species and the colorful chaps that we've seen. As we mentioned, the marabou storks fit sort of in between there where they are fairly common and certainly not considered a bird of prey or a raptor. And here, though, two fairly common visitors that we see to kills, you know, around the country when carcasses do turn up, whether that's from predation or from just natural a natural death. These are often some of the visitors that you'll see arriving along with those marabou stalks to clean up those carcasses. And tawny in particular can be one of the most confusing species out there. A lot of birders get confused between this one and a number of other of the brown eagles like the Wahlberg's eagle and the steppe eagle. I think yeah, there's another one. Eagle. Booted, that's right, yeah. <laughs> The tawny is quite interesting in that it does spend most of its time scavenging. It's probably the most good-looking scavenger out there. I would say so. <laughs> it's interesting with both of these birds, if whenever I'm on safari and out there looking for wildlife, these are often indicator birds for me. They, Them and the battalier eagle or the short-tailed eagle, they often get to kill sites first. So if we go out in the drive or if you're looking out in the morning and you see a tawny and a hooded vulture together or a battalier sitting in a tree it's often a really good place to go and have a look and see if there's something there that they've been feeding on as they get to kill sites first yeah you know moving on to this chap i i, I had a similar experience with this beautiful eagle which i think many of you know what this is it's not a bald eagle <laughs> but they look quite similar of course the african fish eagle I actually spent some time at Chobe where alarm calls from these eagles actually pointed out a leopard for us while we were actually tracking oh, wow. in that area. That's interesting. It's nice to, to use birds for finding different things. Here's a different fellow, the African harrier hawk. Some of you might know there's the gymnogene. 
But it's a beautiful view. Again, the concept of not disturbing the birds when they come down to the water. You don't often get really clear views of any of these, let alone the raptors. But that's quite an interesting shot of the African harrier hawk. And I don't know if any of you, maybe Russ, if you've seen it in breeding plumage with the red face. That one Actually, had funnily yellow... enough, in our, in our garden in Cape Town, I saw <laughs> one in breeding plumage, which is quite special. But moving on, sticking with the birds of prey, but into a different time of day, of course, our nocturnal species. And this one, a spotted eagle owl who was having a little bath, which is quite unusual to see. I must say, I hadn't seen this before, uh, seeing it here on Africa before. I don't know if you'd seen this before. No, no, I've actually seen spotted eagle owl doing some really strange things uh, apart from bathing. But I think last year sometime there was even one playing with a, a dried elephant bolus, the dropping of an elephant, oh, and no almost pretending like it was a, a kill. I thought it might take it as nesting material, but um, some really interesting behavior uh, as far as owls are concerned. And again, just a perfect view of this owl. So it looks like some questions are coming in. Oh, wait, hang on. Before we answer questions, this is my favorite clip. Um, I'm going to put it out there to any birders. Uh, what what bird is that? Um, it's a very unusual bird. It's right up there on many birders' bucket list. I'll give you a hint. It's it's on a waterway. It's at the Olifants River, and uh, this to me is one of the most spectacular sightings that I've seen on the camera as a birder. Um, it's one of the things I always look out for. I have seen them out on safari but i haven't managed to get really clear views and great photographs just look how that eye shines shooting right back into the lens i don't know if you've seen one of these yeah last... funnily enough the first time i saw one was working with you all those years ago in uh, at pinda yeah, pinda yes ah, okay. yeah, along the river which is not far from tembi by the way folks there's another unusual bird that you just don't often get to see because of its nocturnal behavior. It's a white crown, a black crown night heron. And uh, again, we've seen quite a lot of activity of these night herons. And you were talking about Chobi. It's one of the few places I've seen them roosting. But that's because we knew where the roost was yeah, exactly, during the day. Yeah. And that's a big part of birding, folks, that you have to bear in mind. Of course, local guides and the local knowledge of nesting sites um, and your local species or species that are more common to the area. And of course, your specials, you know, you'll get a few endemic species that are special just to that area. Um, as Phil mentioned, you know, Pinda, where we used to work together, is very close to Tembi. And I remember we had to memorize five special birds that we had to try and find for our guests out in the field. And if you remember what those were, Phil, but uh, it was pretty, you know, pretty fun to to tag into the whole safari and and that is also how people generally become birders you know this another special one that we don't see often on the cameras a bronze wing corsa um, but look how big that eye is and another clue for so many of the animals out there that, that are nocturnal of course an adaptation of a big eye plays a big role in allowing them to be active at night and if we can answer some, I, I will see some questions coming in here. We've got colors for the roller, nine. We've got some more, eight. Uh, I think, Pete, you said 11. Oof, I don't know. <laughs> We're getting there. Just have a listen to this bird. Just one of my favorite calls. It's one of the calls as a child. Always let me know that it's now dark. Yeah. Another <laughs> it's, iconic call. Yeah, for sure. the fiery neck nightjar. A beautiful view again. You don't often get to see them, but to hear that wonderful call and how it's sitting on its perch is quite a. It's quite unusual to actually see that. We often see them on the roads, or in open areas keeping quiet and hunting. And uh, 
what I often didn't know why they sat on open areas and why they're always on the road. Because of the open area, they can see the silhouettes of moths and other nocturnal insects flying above them against the lighter sky. And with that very wide mouth, they swoop in and grab them. And here's another unusual shot of night jars actually coming in for a drink. But if you look at their flight pattern, it's actually quite slow. They're not really fast if you compare them to a swallow. But they've got a really wide mouth, the huge gape. And with that, they can actually swallow insects quite accurately. Yeah, if you look carefully, actually, at some of the photographs of, of night jars, and you can actually see those little whiskers around the beak as well. Of course, that's all in aiding to, to line up that meal and make sure that everything gets into the mouth. But it's super sensitive and just another way that they're adapted for hunting at night. But I'd never seen this as well night jars drinking like this you know, at a water hole and again just another special thing that the cameras can bring to us without disturbing the birds out there those whiskers just on that topic are quite particular to nocturnal birds and uh, it actually helps them feel and accurately zone in onto their prey owls also have huge whiskers in fact some owls look like they've got a, a huge uncut beard on um, to help them focus in and zone in on prey, which I thought was quite an interesting concept. The only other ones that have it as well are the fly catchers. Yeah, no, yeah. you're right. And we're starting to see a few more answers coming in here. Looks like we got some smart bird people out there. Ooh, Sally. Very good. Christy's on it. And Pete is on it as well, shockingly. Pete, you can't look at Google. <laughs> and Christy, yeah, brilliant. Pell's fishing owl, that was. Really, really special sighting. I don't know if anyone's actually seen them. Um, I see Christy, it's on your bucket list. Yeah, some parts of Pinda, Botswana. Uh, on the Zambezi River, I've seen them. Yeah. A couple of highlight spots. Talking about interesting sightings, have a look at this reed cormorant. Yeah, yeah, we were just chatting about fishing, and Phil and I were discussing this yesterday when we were choosing videos for the show. It's not often you actually see a cormorant feeding like that, um, and really quite a special behavior, you know. So, of course, we all we all know that they catch fish and frogs and various reptiles and other species around the water, but you don't often actually get to see that happen. Another pretty rare sighting here is this um, cormorant as well, where you're actually seeing um, a data, I'm sorry, Africa data, where you're actually seeing the display of the male, which again, yeah. you never really get to see in the wild. No, I've never seen them in such beautiful, just look at that, his throat, the brown on his throat is really bright and clean. And that feather rack on his back is incredible. It's a bit like a Zulu headdress. And you see him also flapping his throat, gala flapping in display. Uh, the female seems to be giving him the cold shoulder, but uh, who knows how it turns out. But I must say, it's really a very nice example. Just watch as he walks off a bit. Look at those back feathers standing right up. <laughs> I think even the Egyptian goose might be liking what it's seeing. <laughs> yeah, getting his number one drink dress out to impress the ladies but again a really cool sighting and, and something I'd never actually seen out on safari um, and something I was really interested to find when we were going through some of our archives of our videos. But keep those questions coming out there folks. We're always interested in your opinions and thoughts. Yeah, it's, these, uh, it's also a good example here. You can see the long neck, often referred to as the snake bird. When they're in the water, their body is pretty much submerged. And it's quite typical just to see their neck sticking out. And so you can imagine where that nickname comes from. But they're really good spear fishermen and women. They go down and they hunt in the water, not dissimilar to the cormorant. But they load up that neck and dash it forward talking about breeding plumage have a look at this <laughs> fellow yeah so again we wanted to put in some of the more rare sightings and though not the rarest of birds out there 
seeing them in full breeding plumage like this is always quite special. And this, of course, a paradise wider. And that big, beautiful tail is indicative of this species and almost impossible to confuse with anything else. But we've got another little clip that we wanted to show you, the same family. And it just goes to show out there in the wild how many amazing different shapes and sizes there are of all of these birds. And even in the, in the same family, you get these beautiful colorations, but very different looking birds. Yeah, such a stunning bird, especially when it starts displaying. They have a particular loping flight, which makes their tail really flow in the breeze. And you often find one male amongst many females that will go for quite a few of the widers that get this breeding plumage. But what I thought was quite interesting on this particular clip was that that was quite late. It's going into winter. I'm pretty sure he'll lose that plumage. Here's one of my other favorite birds, Russ. The plum-colored starling. I think it's also known as a violet-backed starling, but I love yeah. the name plum-colored <laughs> starling. There's a short clip and another incredible bird family, the bee eaters. These are European bee eaters with that beautiful golden back on their on their wing feathers, and also a nice indicator. And I reckon they'll slowly be heading back to the far northern reaches of Europe. And they do go across into Asia as well to breed. But when they start disappearing, we know winter's here. Yeah, unfortunately, we're approaching that time of year now where we'll start losing these migratory species. So we've gone on from our beautiful widers and the beautiful colorful birds that we get. But these migratory birds, we're starting to see them, of course, head back up north to either into Africa or actually all the way up into the Paleoarctic towards Europe, up towards uh, northern parts of Russia even. Um, so the birds can travel a long way to come here for the summer. And as Phil says, as we start to lose these, we tend to get the feeling that we're heading into winter. But certainly one of the more common birds we get on the cameras in the summer is, of course, the woodlands kingfishers too, often a great indicator for most people that spring and summer have arrived. This is an interesting roller that we don't often see. Uh, they'll go slightly further north into Africa as the purple roller. Uh, I think almost as beautiful as the lilac breasted roller. I don't know if we answered the question on the colors. Those of you that said eight, I think it's well understood that they have eight colors, the lilac breasted roller. This fellow, not quite as colorful, but a beautiful blue nonetheless, the European <laughs> roller. Yeah, another one of our re European visitors, much like the bee, bee eaters that we just spoke about. And again, a summer visitor to our shores, to our reserves, but no less beautiful, as Phil said, even though they don't have all the number of different colors, that beautiful turquoise is indicative of this particular species. And often one that people look out for. It's not as commonly seen as the uh, beautiful. Uh, I, I think it makes rested. up for the beauty in its role. You know, rollers, they yes, have, exactly. each one has a different rolling action and the European roller actually flies up high and comes in full barrel rolls down towards the females. <laughs> the lilac breasted roller just swings from side to side. So I guess you can't have it all, but um, I don't know if anyone's ever seen them displaying, but they have incredible displays, the rollers. That's why they're called rollers. But this European roller definitely gets 10 out of 10 for barrel rolling from incredible heights. <laughs> There's a bit of a blue shade there. Yeah, as he opens his wing and he's preening himself. That's yeah, a nice some shade royal of blue. blue coming yeah. through there. Quite interesting. You often see that the insectivorous birds will sit. We've seen the bee eaters sitting out on these branches. We see the kingfishers sitting out on the, the branches and they'll be grabbing. They use them as perches to hunt. And so it's often uh, you watch when they go away, like what happened with the, with the bee eaters. They go away and they come back again. They're quite nice places to see a lot of birds. This was just a, a last clip of just the basic beauty of birding. A nice movement on this gray heron. Very patiently hunting, a very different hunting technique. 
And we've often seen them being quite successful on the cameras, but just amazing colors as we round up. Another great show, Russ. Yeah, I think so. I hope you all enjoyed that. We're getting towards the end of the show now. If any of you have any last minute questions, send those in quickly for us. We've got a couple of questions that we can address. Margaret was asking, do they only eat bees? I'm sure you were referring to the bee eaters we were chatting about, Margaret. Uh, no, they'll eat all insect, insects that are on the wing. So anything that might come too close to them, they will grab, especially things like termites. And we go into the summer season um, as they take to the wing, flies, things like that. Um, that's pretty much what they will go for um, from those perches, as Phil was explaining. Oh, great, great stuff, Russ. Thanks very much, folks. Thanks for joining us. Wonderful questions, loving the interaction. I do enjoy talking about the birds. It's a great way to add to a safari experience, wildlife experience. Yeah, I think, you know, we've just scratched the surface of things. The bird department is, of course, hugely interactive. And uh, a lot of people out there will spend their life looking for certain species. You know, South Africa, home to around 850 different species and many that are endemic. I think these days they say around 20 endemic birds. Phil, is that right? I think They're so. about, yeah. Yeah. So a very special place for a number of international birders. And, uh, of course, our cameras are out there trying to spot them anytime. But thank you for joining us, everybody. I hope you enjoyed our show on the birds of Africa. Thank you, Max, for looking after us. Thanks, Max. And thank you, Phil. Phil will be back with you all tomorrow, of course. So enjoy the show tomorrow, folks, and we'll catch up with you again next week. Cheers for now.